Zach Laws of Gold Derby here with Scott Alexander and Larry Karaszewski. They're the screenwriters behind Dolomite Is My Name. And you know, Scott and Larry, you guys have written films and television shows about people like Ed Wood, Larry Flint, O.J. Simpson, Margaret Keene, Andy Kaufman. Why Rudy Ray Moore? <laughs> he sounds like he fits in that list. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Um, I think we concentrate um, on people that are extremely passionate about what they want to do, uh, and um, and usually their passion is in something that society in general thinks is wrongheaded, or they think that they're doing it the wrong way, and so it creates this sort of like uh, uh, this drama uh, where they're swimming uh, uh, the wrong direction. Uh, but they have a, a belief in themselves and a belief in the, the, the product. I mean, believe in, you know, Rudy Ray Moore really does, uh, it's a sincere thing. He wants to see, he wants to see the movie he's creating. He wants to listen to the records that he's making. He has a joy to it. Uh, but yeah, just other people can't understand it. Yeah, Andy Kaufman wants, wants to put out performance art that isn't funny. <laughs> no, I, I, I got to clarify, uh, you put OJ in that list. OJ's not a protagonist. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Marsha Clark and Johnny Cochran and Chris Darden are the passionate people trying to fight their own good fight Yeah. in, in, in OJ. But all, all the others do apply. Yes. Right. Well, I mean, I say it to say that, like, you guys – you know, you you cover the gauntlet of all these really fascinating people, and so it's interesting to kind of think like what the connections are. You know, like and they're people who you at first wouldn't think like, yes, this person demands a biopic because biopics usually are about you know presidents and and individuals like that. So tell us a little bit about how you guys came to write this. Was it something that originated with you, or, or how did it come about? I mean, to back up for one second, what you were just saying before we get to the, the, the Rudy origin story, I mean, that what you're talking about is actually something that, that, that we sort of uh, helped pioneer, I think, in the 90s, in the sense that um, uh, when we uh, made Ed Wood, uh, you know, it was, uh, it, was so, it was really well received and won Academy Awards and things like that, but it really felt like a different kind of uh, biopic. That mm -hmm. most biopics were three hours long. Yeah, I mean, and, when, we, when we wrote it, I mean, we were, you know, just two unemployed screenwriters who were sort of on the on the uh, career roller coaster. And at that point, we couldn't get a job, and so we sort of talked about this 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 guy that we admired, Ed Wood, who was just known for being a joke and making terrible movies. And we said, well, what if you dig him out of the margins and you uh, and you celebrate him and you look at him positively? And this was this was kind of a, a crazy weird idea. And when we told friends we were writing this, people just kind of looked at us like, "Why? Who would want to see that movie? Why would you want to make that movie?" But like Larry said, it, it was the, it was Ed's passion that we were really into, and that that sort of became our mantra with all these projects, which, which is we we didn't really care about presidents or great inventors or great statesmen or people who have change the world for the better. We, we kind of care about people who have lived interesting lives and maybe they're in the margins, but they really believe in what they did. And we sort of feel like everyone's life can be valid. Right. Mm -hmm. And it was, it was actually the, the people that we were kind of passionate about. They were the people that we were reading books about or going to see, going to the new art to see the movies, uh, the movies for. Um, and also we looked at the biopic genre in general. And, you know, most genres change over time, whether like, like the Western, you had the John Ford period, which led to the Sam Peckinpah violence period, which led to the operatic, you know, Sergio Leone kind of movies. They, 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 they change over time. The biopic has always stayed the same. It's always been three hours. I mean, just, it was just, sort of in that, it was in that Richard Attenborough period. <laughs> which is not, which is is not to knock Richard yeah, Attenborough. Correct, correct. It's a fine filmmaker, but we were sort of in that, in that Gandhi Chaplin <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> You know, the, the, the people of great achievement. Right. And our secret sauce is to, is to sort of look at it a different way, kind of a fringe history of the, uh, of the 20th century. And we often would just say it's they're biopics for people who usually don't get biopics or the anti-great man biopic. Uh, and we came to Rudy, uh, you know, this sounds like a long story we're making even longer. <laughs> we came to Rudy uh, because of Ed Wood. <laughs> we have to wrap it up now. Uh, <laughs> talking to the Gold Derby. Uh, yeah. I think my one-hour parking inspired. <laughs> um, that we got a phone call one day uh, uh, saying that Eddie Murphy wants to meet you, and we're like, oh, "This is like in the early 2000s." Yeah, this is this was a long time ago, and we're like, "Holy crap! Well, Eddie Murphy wants to meet us. How cool is that?" So we drove out to meet Eddie Murphy, 
And when we got there and we walked in, he just started doing lines from Ed Wood. He was doing literally Shore Johnson and Bella Lugosi. And it was just like, we were stunned that Eddie Murphy was like, like, you know, doing and, our and, stuff. Eddie's got a steel trap mind for yeah. movie dialogue. So he was doing the scenes perfect. Yeah, it was amazing. Mm -hmm. um, and then he turned to us and said, do you know who Rudy Ray Moore is? And it was a, it was a holy shit moment because uh, Scott and I were kind of obsessed with Rudy Ray Moore. Uh, yeah, and, yeah, yeah. I mean, we had, uh, right in, in college, we had a friend who was running a video store and he came home with a tape called The Best of Sex and Violence, which was <laughs> two hours of genre trailers. Yeah, exploitation stuff. Exploitation, driving pictures, and, and, and the, um, the, the centerpiece of the tape <laughs> of this VHS were, were the trailers for Dolomite, Human Tornado, and Disco Godfather, especially Human Tornado, which yeah. is the greatest three minutes of all time. And we would, we watched the tapes over and over and over, and we would invite friends over saying, you got to sit down on the couch. You just got it. You will not believe this. Right. And so we became obsessed with Rudy. I saw him play at the Club Lingerie. One of my birthdays came around, and, and Scott... Uh, yeah, I, I actually, I, I, back then, back in the 80s, you couldn't really buy VHSs. You could rent them because they were priced to rent, not to sell. Yeah, they were like $100 a tape. You, you young oh, wow. lovers snappers don't realize how expensive VHSs were. Yeah, I mean... <laughs> Back then, if you wanted to buy a copy of Gun Ho, it was a hundred dollars. <laughs> <laughs> oh, someone off camera laughed. Uh, and and so uh, I, I actually drove out to Xenon Video's headquarters and I showed it with a hundred dollars uh, cash to buy Larry his birthday present of Human Tornado. Yeah. So yeah, uh, our, yeah our love goes back back to the eighties. And so Eddie was really surprised because he thought he'd have to like you know. He thought he'd have to educate us about Rudy, and he was so happy that we, we shared his passion. And we instantly knew we got what he wanted to do. We got the fact that, like, oh, my God, Eddie Murphy uh, as Rudy Ray Moore, that's, that's unbelievable. I mean, Scott and I, we, uh, we're very lucky. We, get to, we write movies that we want to see. We, do, we write movies that if they open, if we had nothing to do with them, if we open the LA Times and look at the paper and this movie is, you know, playing at the Arclight, we'd be instantly buying tickets. And so this was a movie we'd buy tickets for. I mean, Eddie Murphy as Rudy Ray Moore is, is just a, such a delicious idea. So we instantly, you know, said, yes, let's, hop, let's get this going. And, and Eddie got us in a room with the real Rudy. Yeah, just a few days later, uh, we met with Rudy. He showed up full regalia. He showed up with the green hat. The suit, the cane, the whole the whole show, and we're like, oh my god, Dolomite's here, and <laughs> he starts doing the shtick. But then I mean, we hung out with him for you know for the day, and after a certain point, he kind of he kind of dropped the facade, and we started to see that this is an old guy. He's tired. Uh, I mean, he's been on the road. He's been on the road for forty <laughs> years. He's been sitting at that merch table trying to sell T-shirts and back scratchers for, yeah, for decades. He's been driving around that card table you know since the early seventies. Yeah. And you know he's tired, and he really he really wanted this. He wanted the respect. He wanted the acclamation. He, you know, he wanted Hollywood to take him seriously, and finally put him up on that pedestal that you know, Rudy had a big ego that he felt he deserved. Yeah. But we could sort of see that Rudy and Dolomite were two different guys. Yeah, and that mm -hmm. that really struck us, and that sort of became the premise of the script, which was that everyone knows Dolomite, but no one really knows Rudy, who, who is this soft-spoken, thoughtful, uh, introverted guy. And, mm -hmm. and Dolomite was a character he created, and he's old. Right, and that's why the movie's called Dolomite Is My Name. I mean, that is his, part of his catchphrase, uh, the clean part of his catchphrase. <laughs> uh, but... Um, uh, the first four letters. Yeah, first it, four words. Um, it, uh, but it, it's sort of the, the thesis, and that, that Dolomite is a name that, is a, that he created, that Dolomite is someone, is someone that, that he, becomes, he becomes a different person with Dolomite. Same way when he meets uh, Lady Reed, and she becomes Queen Bee. You know, so this is, this, is, this is something we really got into. And then um, we went to try to sell the project with Eddie, and studios didn't care. No one, no one was really interested, even with us and Eddie. I mean, I think they, I think they saw the Human Tornado trailer that Scott loves so dearly, <laughs> and it scared the shit out of them. They were like, "Oh my God, what are these people really? Do they really expect us to make this?" Uh, it's sort of the same kind of rejection that that Rudy gets in, in the movie <laughs> when, Rudy try, when Rudy tries to sell himself. Yeah, uh, people were like, "No, <laughs> no, no way." And um, so we felt really terrible. We, uh, you know, that we had sort of disappointed once again. Hollywood disappointed the, uh, Rudy Ray Moore. And we all wanted... and then, but this is this is also the, the, it's a story of, of being whatever being a writer or a producer I'd say in town is a lot of times you get excited about a project you want to do you try to make it happen it doesn't happen yeah 
And then, you know, as a, as a working professional, you just got to move on. You've got to say, well, that was a drag. It didn't happen. But now I have to go find my next job. Sure, you're that Willie Loman with your suitcase. Go ahead. Yeah. <laughs> going, to get your, going to get your next gig. I, I got a family comedy. I got a, I got a dog. <laughs> <laughs> um, and so, uh, like, a couple years ago, my Rudy died. And we felt kind of terrible uh, because we had sort of told him we were going to make yeah, a movie about him. Larry did a tribute night. Yeah, I did a tribute at the mm -hmm. American Cinematheque. And I got uh, Jerry Jones, who uh, was a screenwriter for... Um, That's Keegan's for, character. Yeah, Keegan's character. We got, I got Ben Taylor, who was... Uh, That's Craig, Craig Robinson. Robinson. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know? and, uh, and Nicholas Von Stern. That's Bergen. Cody Smith. The, 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 he was like the young, the, the young UCLA student who's a DP. They all came down and told Rudy stories, and it was really a beautiful night. Um, and then even more years went by. I mean, we always figured we blew it. We figured someone would come along and or, or make the, this movie. Or the world blew it. The world blew it, or like, you know, but, but every once in a while we'd hear like, hey, someone bought, got the rights to the reboot Dolomite, or someone wants to do the Rudy Ray Morse story. And we always, like I said, there was a movie we wanted to see. So we thought, it was, oh, great, please, someone make this movie. Yeah, please, I mean, someone I make mean, this movie. Yeah. Over the years, a handful of people chased us down. They heard that we had tried to do with Rudy years earlier, and they would try to have us come in and grandfather or the producer or whatever. And we said, no, 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 we just, we, we look forward to the movie. We'll be the person line to buy a ticket, but. Yeah. Good luck. Go do it. And it never happened. And so a couple of years ago, Scott and I created American Crime Story, The People vs. O.J. Simpson. And it was a gigantic success. And uh, whatever. We, we make movies about Hollywood, so we know how Hollywood works. We know that if you have that kind of a hit, you can kind of sometimes go into a, a, a movie studio with an idea that would have rejected uh, uh, any other week of the year um, and uh, be taken seriously. And so we sort of looked at it and we were like, what, what are our dream projects? What are the things that like, you know, that we, that really mean something to us that we would love, you know, if we're going to, we're going to drop dead in a couple of years, what would be the cool, what would be the cool thing you'd like to leave behind? And it was, it was Rudy Ray Moore. And so we got through John Fox and John Davis, the producers, John Davis had made a bunch of movies with Eddie Murphy. We got word back to Eddie. It wasn't like we're, you know, it wasn't like, you know, we had Eddie on, on auto style. Or anything. <laughs> <laughs> you know? And Eddie had kind of some yeah, idea. We, we were just in a general meeting with John and John and, and just shooting the shit and talk about this. And they got really excited and say, well, do you want to do it? And he said, you want to do it? Like now? He says, yeah, let, here, I'm calling up Eddie right now. Like, hey, hey, wait, 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 let's think. Let's think. It's like, you know, yeah. we've got this next thing we have to write. You know, we're, we're kind of busy. He's like, no, this is great. Let's do it. All right, let's do it. And Eddie said, I'm in. And then we saw Eddie the next day. And then they made they made magic happen. A couple of days later, we're in a room with Ted Sarandos. Larry had a big, Larry and I had a big pitch worked out. We got about five seconds into the pitch. And then Eddie walked in and Eddie just turned into Rudy in the room. And then, whatever, you've sold the movie at that point. Right. <laughs> once, once Eddie is doing Rudy. We kept on trying to go back to our pitch, and I think uh, John Davis kept on hitting us, like, no, no, dude. Shut up, sold idiots. It. Shut up. Let's get out of the room. We <laughs> sold the thing. Don't, 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 don't confuse them with information. And, and, and Ted Sarandos, to his credit, was a giant fan going in because uh, I think he ran video stores in the 80s, and he said, guys, I know Rudy. He kept us in business. Yeah. <laughs> because <laughs> tapes, those Rudy right. tapes, though, they always moved. Yeah, and and so Ted and Netflix were on board, and they were just they were so supportive. Mm -hmm. They loved the project. And then Craig Brewer as well. At what point did he come in, and how did that help uh, change the dynamic of it? Um, it actually didn't change the dynamic because uh, Craig was just. What's been great about this movie is everybody was on the same page. I mean, they. Uh, I mean, Craig, Craig yeah. made the movie more musical. Oh, absolutely, hundred mm -hmm. percent. But I mean, they, they definitely he brought. Craig Brewer, Craig, Craig is an amazing director. I mean, Craig has such an understanding of struggling musicians and the road life and the world of clubs and just sort of the, 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 the grittiness of what, what it's like to be out there on that stage with those instruments and that sweat. Mm -hmm. And uh, he, he, he gets that struggle. So uh, Craig came on, I mean, we, we wrote a draft, uh, went to Eddie, Eddie said, let's do it, let's do it. And uh, Eddie was a big fan of Hustle and Flow. Yeah, Eddie, Eddie loved Hustle and Flow going in. Eddie, Eddie was a fan of Craig. And, uh, you know, what's great about Craig is he made it, uh, uh, he made it feel real. I mean, I remember when the first couple of days on the set, we were shooting some of the Chitlin Circuit scenes, and we were in, like, a, a parking lot or a nightclub uh, set. And it just, because he's from Memphis, because he knows that world, it just felt lived in and real and not jokey and not, you know, it's so easy 
to when you're making the 1970s movie where you're just sort of like, ha, 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 they're wearing platform shoes or that hat is funny. I mean, Ruth Carter, who's a genius, did our costumes, and the costumes are completely outrageous, but they feel like people lived in them. Those are that They feel like Rudy's actual clothing. And, and I think Craig really was a total brilliant guy guiding that, keeping everybody as outrageously funny as they could be, but grounding it in a reality. Yeah. Um, I think, I mean, you bring up an interesting point. Like, I think the movie surprises people because on the surface you think, well, it's going to be kitschy and kind of goofy, but there's a, there's a real uh, heart to it as well, you know, that keeps it grounded in reality. You know, I think there's a, there's a surprising amount of empathy that you feel for all these right. folks, just like in Ed Wood, you know, like you, you go yeah. in thinking you're going to laugh at the cheesiness of it, but you know, it, it's about dreamers. Yeah. I, I mean, w w we knew it was going to have that in common with Ed Wood and we actually were resisting it being too similar, uh, which I, I think made the movie uh, for the better uh, because we, we really sort of thought about making the movie about segregation and separate, but equal in terms of sort of, tackling issues that have nothing to do with Ed Wood. I mean, yes, it, it, the movie was always going to get to a point where they're, where they're, it's a bunch of goofballs trying to make a movie for the first time, and that's, that's always fun. Mm -hmm. um, but this, we sort of really thought about this idea uh, that you're, you're, you're in the 1970s, and you, you and people think, think 1970s. My God, the 70s is, is, is modern and post-civil rights and all that, but these are a bunch of black actors and actresses and singers and, and writers who can't get through the the gates yeah. and they're sort of stuck in in their own separate world and they, they're playing uh, in their own nightclubs for black audiences and uh and uh like we 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 interviewed uh some some actors uh glenn Turman and hawthorne james who are really involved with the inner city cultural center explained that this was a, a a real place for serious black actors and actresses and directors and writers to hone their craft because they weren't getting jobs. Right. And they might, you know, they might, they might get one or two gigs a year and the rest of the time they would, they would show up on stage in, in this theater for black audiences. And we sort of thought this is such an unusual world that we've never really heard about before. And it really makes you understand Rudy's struggle and Rudy's feeling that he's an outsider and that no one's going to give him that job, so he has to give himself that job. Yeah, but also, also, it was about the lack of representation on screen. I mean, I think one of the key moments when we were writing the script was writing that that scene, which now it's the front page when they go see that movie. And you know, it's, which, which is a metaphor. Yeah, uh, it's one of those things. But you know, you just think of the front page or any of those you know big movies of the seventies and their general audience pleasing kind of films. But all you and Craig did such a good job. Where you go to the screen and you go to the audience laughing, and then you hit that row with Rudy and his friends, and it's like you instantly say, "Oh my God!" Of course, you know, there's nothing wrong with Matt Allen Lemon. Matt Allen Lemon are great. Uh, Billy Wilder directed the movie for crying out loud. Um, but it's like you see that row and you realize, wait a second, Hollywood was ignoring these people. Hollywood was not like off. There was no way they could look at that screen and identify with anything that was going on there. Not that they, you know, uh, and so so Rudy is forced to actually let's let's create our own cinema. Let's create our own world. Mm -hmm. And my, the most touching part of the movie is seeing people watching Dolomite and seeing the end of this journey for Rudy. So I have to imagine, like, for you guys um, to finally see this movie realized after so many years, um, I mean, that must be pretty special, right? Yeah, I, I mean, the again, in terms of being meta, 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 the moment that always really touches me, which is just me projecting myself into the screen, is the moment of Eddie watching the audience enjoy the movie. Yeah. yeah. At, the, at the Uptown in Indianapolis, where he's just standing in the back of the theater and he's just got this look of wonder in his eyes. Like, I can't believe this works and they're enjoying it the way I wanted them to enjoy it. And every, every time Eddie gives that smile, I, I just feel great. Yeah. And what's, what's kind of great is like in Ed Wood, we gave, we created a happy ending for Ed Wood in that, in that you know, the Plan 9 from Outer Space never played the Pantages Theater. But we gave Ed. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, oh, no. uh, but it gave it gave the movie. It was almost like in Edward's mind. This is the he, this is the movie he'll be remembered for. It's a fairy tale. But, it, but it's uh, but it's not. You know, the, this isn't really how it ended. Um, uh, but in Rudy's case, he was making movies that 
connected with an audience. And, the, and he, they were big hits. They were big hits. And so for him, seeing that crowd in Indianapolis, that's the way it actually happened. When the, the very last scene in the movie where uh, uh, it actually took place in real life. In real life, it was at the Woods Theater in Chicago. And it was, uh, it was the premiere in Chicago. And, you know, it was so popular that they added these 2 a.m. shows. And Rudy realized that people were going to be standing there all night long. And he literally set up a uh, thing on the sidewalk and decided he was going to entertain them outside all night long until every person got in. And we heard that. It was he, just like, you know. He just gave away our ending. That's the, <laughs> oh, oh, he's seen it four times already. So hopefully. Yeah. He but, you know, it's just a beautiful thing. And that, that, that led to that Lady Reed scene where she says, like, she's never seen someone like her up on that screen. And so I think the... I, I think the 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 humanity and the, and the, uh, you know I've been told by so many people that they see the film they're laughing 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 and it gets to a part and they're like wait a second am I actually I'm actually crying at that yeah. oh my is my name I wasn't expecting this yeah well it's a it's a great movie thank you guys so much for your time congratulations on your work I'm so happy to so see it finally on the screen well thank you thanks take care thank you.